Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Chapter 2 Slavery and Escape. That evil influence which carried me first away from my father's house, which hurried me into the wild and indigested notion of raising my fortune, and that impressed those conceits so forcibly upon me as to make me deaf to all good advice, and to the entreaties and even the commands of my father, I say, the same influence, whatever it was, presented the most unfortunate of all enterprises to my view, and I went on board a vessel bound to the coast of Africa, or, as our soldiers vulgarly called it, a voyage to Guinea. It was my great misfortune that in all these adventures I did not ship myself as a sailor, when, though I might indeed have worked a little harder than ordinary, yet at the same time I should have learnt the duty and office of a foremast man, and in time might have qualified myself for a mate or lieutenant, if not for a master. But as it was always my fate to choose for the worse, so I did here, for having money in my pocket and good clothes upon my back, I would always go on board in the habit of a gentleman, and so I neither had any business in the ship, nor learned to do any. It was my lot, first of all, to fall into pretty good company in London, which does not always happen to such loose and misguided young fellows as I then was, the devil generally not omitting to lay some snare for them very early. But it was not so with me. I first got acquainted with the master of a ship who had been on the coast of Guinea, and who, having had very good success there, was resolved to go again. This captain taking a fancy to my conversation, which was not at all disagreeable at that time, hearing me say I had a mind to see the world, told me if I would go the voyage with him, I should be at no expense. I should be his messmate and his companion, and if I could carry anything with me, I should have all the advantage of it that the trade would admit, and perhaps I might meet with some encouragement. I embraced the offer, and entering into a strict friendship with this captain, who was an honest, plain-dealing man, I went the voyage with him, and carried a small adventure with me, which, by the disinterested honesty of my friend the captain, I increased very considerably, for I carried about forty pounds in such toys and trifles as the captain directed me to buy. These forty pounds I had mustered together by the assistance of some of my relations whom I corresponded with, and who, I believe, got my father, or at least my mother, to contribute so much as that to my first adventure. This was the only voyage which I may say was successful in all my adventures, which I owe to the integrity and honesty of my friend the captain, under whom also I got a competent knowledge of the mathematics and the rules of navigation, learned how to keep an account of the ship's course, take an observation, and in short, to understand some things that were needful to be understood by a sailor. For as he took delight to instruct me, I took delight to learn." and, in a word, this voyage may be both a sailor and a merchant, for I brought home five pounds nine ounces of gold dust for my adventure, which yielded me in London, at my return, almost three hundred pounds, and this filled me with those aspiring thoughts which have since so completed my ruin. Yet even in this voyage I had my misfortunes too, particularly that I was continually sick, being thrown into a violent calenture by the excessive heat of the climate, our principal trading being upon the coast, from latitude of fifteen degrees north even to the line itself. I was now set up for a guinea trader, and my friend, to my great misfortune, dying soon after his arrival, I resolved to go the same voyage again, and I embarked in the same vessel with one who was his mate in the former voyage, and had now got command of the ship. This was the unhappiest voyage that ever man made, for though I did not carry quite one hundred pounds of my new gained wealth, so that I had two hundred pounds left, which I lodged with my friend's widow, who was very just to me, yet I fell into terrible misfortunes. The first was this, our ship making her course towards the Canary Islands, or rather between those islands and the African shore, was surprised in the grey of the morning by a Turkish rover of Sali who gave chase to us with all the sail she could make. We crowded also as much canvas as our yards would spread, or our masts carry, to get clear. But finding the pirate gained upon us, and would certainly come up with us in a few hours, we prepared to fight, our ship having twelve guns, and the rogue eighteen. 
About three in the afternoon he came up with us, and bringing to, by mistake, just athwart our quarter, instead of athwart our stern, as he intended, we brought eight of our guns to bear on that side, and poured in a broadside upon him, which made him sheer off again, after returning our fire, and pouring in also his small shot from near two hundred men which he had on board. However, we had not a man touched, all our men keeping close. He prepared to attack us again, and we to defend ourselves. But laying us on board the next time upon our other quarter, he entered sixty men upon our decks, who immediately fell to cutting and hacking the sails and rigging. We plied them with small shot, half-pikes, powder chests, and such like, and cleared our deck of them twice. However, to cut short this melancholy part of our story, our ship being disabled, and three of our men killed, and eight wounded, we were obliged to yield, and were carried all prisoners into Sally, a port belonging to the Moors. The usage I had there was not so dreadful as at first I apprehended, nor was I carried up the country to the Emperor's court, as the rest of our men were, but was kept by the captain of the rover as his proper prize, and made his slave, being young and nimble, and fit for his business. At this surprising change of my circumstances, from a merchant to a miserable slave, I was perfectly overwhelmed, and now I looked back upon my father's prophetic discourse to me, that I should be miserable and have none to relieve me, which I thought was now so effectually brought to pass that I could not be worse." for now the hand of heaven had overtaken me, and I was undone without redemption. But, alas, this was but a taste of the misery I was to go through, as will appear in the sequel of this story. As my new patron, or master, had taken me home to his house, so I was in hopes that he would take me with him when he went to sea again, believing that it would some time or other be his fate to be taken by a Spanish or Portugal man of war and that then I should be set at liberty. But this hope of mine was soon taken away, for when he went to sea, he left me on shore to look after his little garden, and do the common drudgery of slaves about his house. And when he came home again from his cruise, he ordered me to lie in the cabin to look after the ship. Here I meditated nothing but my escape, and what method I might take to effect it, but found no way that had the least probability in it, Nothing presented to make the supposition of it rational, for I had nobody to communicate it to that would embark with me, no fellow-slave, no Englishman, Irishman, or Scotchman there but myself, so that for two years, though I often pleased myself with the imagination, yet I never had the least encouraging prospect of putting it in practice. After about two years, an odd circumstance presented itself, which put the old thought of making some attempt for my liberty again in my head. My patron lying at home longer than usual, without fitting out his ship, which, as I heard, was for want of money, he used constantly, once or twice a week, sometimes oftener if the weather was fair, to take the ship's pinnace and go out into the road of fishing and as he always took me and young Moresco with him to row the boat, we made him very merry, and I proved very dexterous in catching fish, insomuch that sometimes he would send me with a moor, one of his kinsmen, and the youth, the Moresco, as they called him, to catch a dish of fish for him. It happened one time that going a-fishing in a calm morning, a fog rose so thick that, though we were not half a league from the shore, we lost sight of it, and rowing we knew not whither or which way, we laboured all day and all the next night, and when the morning came we found we had pulled off to sea instead of pulling in for the shore, and that we were at least two leagues from the shore. However, we got well in again, though with a great deal of labor and some danger, for the wind began to blow pretty fresh in the morning, but we were all very hungry. But our patron, warned by this disaster, resolved to take more care of himself for the future and having lying by him the longboat of our English ship that he had taken, he resolved he would not go a-fishing any more without a compass and some provision. So he ordered the carpenter of his ship, who was also an English slave, to build a little state-room or cabin in the middle of the longboat, like that of a barge, with a place to stand behind it to steer, and haul home the main-sheet, the room before for a hand or two to stand and work the sails. 
She sailed with what we call a shoulder of mutton sail, and the boom jibed over the top of the cabin, which lay very snug and low, and had in it room for him to lie, with a slave or two, and a table to eat on, with some small lockers to put in some bottles of such liquor as he thought fit to drink, and his bread, rice, and coffee. We went frequently out with this boat a-fishing, and as I was most dexterous to catch fish for him, he never went without me. It happened that he had appointed to go out in this boat, either for pleasure or for fish, with two or three moors of some distinction in that place, and for whom he had provided extraordinarily, and had, therefore, sent on board the boat overnight a larger store of provisions than ordinary, and had ordered me to get ready three fusees with powder and shot, which were on board his ship, so that they designed some sport of fowling as well as fishing. I got all things ready as he had directed, and waited the next morning with the boat washed clean, her ancient and pendants out, and everything to accommodate his guests, when by and by my patron came on board alone, and told me his guests had put off going from some business that fell out, and ordered me, with the man and boy, as usual, to go out with the boat and catch them some fish so that his friends were to sup at his house, and commanded that as soon as I got some fish I should bring it home to his house, all of which I prepared to do. This moment my former notions of deliverance darted into my thoughts, for now I found I was likely to have a little ship at my command, and my master being gone, I prepared to furnish myself, not for fishing business, but for a voyage, though I knew not, neither did I so much as consider whither I should steer. Anywhere to get out of that place was my desire. My first contrivance was to make a pretense to speak to this moor, to get something for our subsistence on board, for I told him we must not presume to eat of our patron's bread. He said that was true, so he brought a large basket of rusk or biscuit, and three jars of fresh water into the boat. I knew where my patron's case of bottles stood, which it was evident, by the make, were taken out of some English prize, and I conveyed them into the boat while the moor was on shore, as if they had been there before for our master. I conveyed also a great lump of beeswax into the boat, which weighed about half a hundred weight, with a parcel of twine or thread, a hatchet, a saw, and a hammer, all of which were of great use to us afterwards, especially the wax, to make candles. Another trick I tried upon him, which he innocently came into also. His name was Ismail, which they call Muley or Moly, so I called to him, Moly, said I, our patron's guns are on board the boat. Can you not get a little powder and shot? It may be we may kill some alchemies, a fowl like our curlews, for ourselves, for I know he keeps the gunner's stores in the ship. Yes, says he. I'll bring some. And accordingly he brought a great leather pouch, which held a pound and a half of powder, or rather more, and another with shot, that had five or six pounds, with some bullets, and put all into the boat. At the same time I had found some powder of my master's in the great cabin, with which I filled one of the large bottles in the case, which was almost empty, pouring what was in it into another. And thus furnished with everything needful, we sailed out of the port to fish. The castle, which is at the entrance of the port, knew who we were, and took no notice of us, and we were not above a mile out of port before we hauled in our sail and set us down to fish. The wind blew from the north-northeast, which was contrary to my desire, for had it blown southerly I had been sure to have made the coast of Spain, and at least reached to the Bay of Cadiz, but my resolutions were, blow which way it would, I would be gone from that horrid place where I was, and leave the rest to fate. After we had fished some time and caught nothing, for when I had fish on my hook I would not pull them up, that he might not see them, I said to the moor, This will not do. Our master will not be thus served. We must stand farther off. He, thinking no harm, agreed, and being in the head of the boat, set the sails, and, as I had the helm, I ran the boat out near a league farther, and then brought her to, as if I would fish, when, giving the boy the helm, I stepped forward to where the moor was, and making as if I stooped for something behind him, I took him by surprise with my arm under his waist, and tossed him clear overboard into the sea. 
He rose immediately, for he swam like a cork, and called to me, begged to be taken in, told me he would go all over the world with me. He swam so strong after the boat that he would have reached me very quickly, there being but little wind, upon which I stepped into the cabin, and, fetching one of the fowling pieces, I presented it at him, and told him I had done him no hurt, and if he would be quiet, I would do him none. But, said I, you swim well enough to reach to the shore, and the sea is calm. Make the best of your way to shore, and I will do you no harm. But if you come near the boat, I'll shoot you through the head, for I am resolved to have my liberty. So he turned himself about, and swam for the shore, and I make no doubt but he reached it with ease, for he was an excellent swimmer. I could have been content to have taken this moor with me, and have drowned the boy, but there was no venturing to trust him. When he was gone, I turned to the boy, whom they called Zuri, and said to him, Zuri, if you will be faithful to me, I'll make you a great man. But if you will not stroke your face to be true to me, that is, swear by Mohammed and his father's beard, I must throw you into the sea too. The boy smiled in my face, and spoke so innocently that I could not distrust him, and swore to be faithful to me, and go all over the world with me. While I was in view of the moor that was swimming, I stood out directly to sea with a boat, rather stretching to windward, that they might think me gone toward the strait's mouth, as indeed any one that had been in their wits must have been supposed to do. For who would have supposed we were sailed on to the southward, to the truly barbarian coast, where whole nations of negroes were sure to surround us with their canoes and destroy us, where we could not go on shore but we should be devoured by savage beasts, or more merciless savages of humankind. But as soon as it grew dusk in the evening, I changed my course, and steered directly south and by east, bending my course a little towards the east, that I might keep in with the shore, and having a fair fresh gale of wind, and a smooth quiet sea, I made such sail that I believe by the next day, at three o'clock in the afternoon, when I first made the land, I could not be less than one hundred and fifty miles south of Sali quite beyond the Emperor of Morocco's dominions, or indeed of any other king thereabouts, for we saw no people. Yet such was the fright I had taken of the Moors, and the dreadful apprehensions I had of falling into their hands, that I would not stop, or go on shore, or come to an anchor, the wind continuing fair till I had sailed in that manner five days, and then the wind shifting to the southward, I concluded also that if any of our vessels were in chase of me, they also would now give over. So I ventured to make to the coast, and came to an anchor in the mouth of a little river, I knew not what, nor where, neither what latitude, what country, what nation, or what river. I neither saw nor desired to see any people. The principal thing I wanted was fresh water. We came into this creek in the evening, resolving to swim on shore as soon as it was dark, and discover the country. But as soon as it was quite dark, we heard such dreadful noises of the barking, roaring, and howling of wild creatures, of we knew not what kinds, that the poor boy was ready to die with fear, and begged of me not to go on shore till day. "'Well, Zuri,' said I, "'then I won't. But it may be that we may see men by day, who will be as bad to us as those lions.' "'Then we give them the shoot-gun,' says Zuri, laughing. "'Make them run way.' Such English Zuri spoke by conversing among us slaves. However, I was glad to see the boy so cheerful, and I gave him a dram, out of our patron's case of bottles, to cheer him up. After all, Zuri's advice was good, and I took it. We dropped our little anchor, and lay still all night. I say still, for we slept none, for in two or three hours we saw vast great creatures, we knew not what to call them, of many sorts, come down to the seashore and run into the water, wallowing and washing themselves for the pleasure of cooling themselves, and they made such hideous howlings and yellings that I never indeed heard the like. Surrey was dreadfully frighted, and indeed so was I, too, but we were both more frighted when we heard one of these mighty creatures come swimming towards our boat. We could not see him, but we might hear him by his blowing to be a monstrous, huge, and furious beast. Zuri said it was a lion, and it might be so, for aught I know. But poor Zuri cried to me to weigh the anchor and row away. No, says I, 
Surrey, we can slip our cable, with the buoy to it, and go off to sea. They cannot follow us far. I had no sooner said so, but I perceived the creature, whatever it was, within two oars' length, which somewhat surprised me. However, I immediately stepped to the cabin door, and taking up my gun, fired at him, upon which he immediately turned about and swam towards the shore again. But it is impossible to describe the horrid noises and hideous cries and howlings that were raised, as well upon the edge of the shore as higher within the country, upon the noise or report of the gun, a thing I have some reason to believe those creatures had never heard before. This convinced me that there was no going on shore for us in the night on that coast, and how to venture on shore in the day was another question, too. For to have fallen into the hands of any of the savages had been as bad as to have fallen into the hands of the lions and tigers. At least we were equally apprehensive of the danger of it. Be that as it would, we were obliged to go on shore somewhere or other for water, for we had not a pint left in the boat. When and where to get to it was the point. Suri said if I would let him go on shore with one of the jars, he would find if there was any water and bring some to me. I asked him why he would go, why I should not go, and he stay in the boat. The boy answered with so much affection as made me love him ever after. Says he, If wild men come, they eat me, you go away. Well, Suri, said I, we will both go, and if the wild mans come, we will kill them. They shall eat neither of us. So I gave Tsuri a piece of rusk bread to eat, and a dram out of our patron's case of bottles which I mentioned before, and we hauled the boat in as near the shore as we thought was proper, and so waded on shore, carrying nothing but our arms and two jars for water. I did not care to go out of sight of the boat, fearing the coming of canoes with savages down the river, but the boy seeing a low place about a mile up the country, rambled to it. And by and by I saw him come running towards me. I thought he was pursued by some savage, or frighted with some wild beast, and I ran forward towards him to help him, but when I came nearer to him I saw something hanging over his shoulders, which was a creature that he had shot, like a hare, but different in colour, and longer legs. However, we were very glad of it, and it was very good meat. But the great joy the poor Zuri came with was to tell me he had found good water and seen no wild man's. But we found afterwards that we need not take such pains for water, for a little higher up the creek where we were we found the water fresh when the tide was out, which flowed but a little way up. So we filled our jars, and feasted on the hare he had killed, and prepared to go on our way, having seen no footsteps of any human creature in that part of the country. As I had been one voyage to this coast before, I knew very well that the islands of the Canaries, and the Cape de Verde islands also, lay not far off from the coast. But as I had no instruments to take an observation to know what latitude we were in, and not exactly knowing, or at least remembering, what latitude they were in, I knew not where to look for them, or when to stand off to sea towards them. Otherwise I might now easily have found some of these islands. But my hope was, that if I stood along this coast till I came to that part where the English traded, I should find some of their vessels upon their usual design of trade, that would relieve and take us in. By the best of my calculation, that place where I now was must be that country which, lying between the Emperor of Morocco's dominions and the Negroes, lies waste and uninhabited, except by wild beasts, the Negroes having abandoned it and gone farther south for fear of the Moors and the Moors not thinking it worth inhabiting by reason of its barrenness, and indeed both forsaking it because of the prodigious number of tigers, lions, leopards, and other furious creatures which harbour there, so that the Moors use it for their hunting only, where they go like an army, two or three thousand men at a time, and indeed for near a hundred miles together upon this coast, we saw nothing but a waste, uninhabited country by day, and heard nothing but howlings and roaring of wild beasts by night. Once or twice in the daytime I thought I saw the Pico of Tenerife, being the high top of the mountain Tenerife in the Canaries, and had a great mind to venture out, in hopes of reaching thither. But having tried twice, I was forced in again by contrary winds, the sea also going too high for my little vessel. So I resolved to pursue my first design, and keep along the shore." 
Several times I was obliged to land for fresh water, after we had left this place, and once in particular, being early in morning, we came to an anchor under a little point of land, which was pretty high, and the tide beginning to flow, we lay still to go farther in. Tsuri, whose eyes were more about him than it seems mine were, calls softly to me, and tells me that we had best go farther off the shore. For, says he, look, yonder lies a dreadful monster on the side of that hillock fast asleep. I looked where he pointed, and saw a dreadful monster indeed, for it was a terrible great lion that lay on the side of the shore, under the shade of a piece of the hill that hung, as it were, a little over him. Tsuri, says I, you shall on shore and kill him. Tsuri looked frighted, and said, Me kill, he eat me at one mouth. One mouthful, he meant. However, I said no more to the boy, but bade him lie still, and I took our biggest gun, which was almost musket bore, and loaded it with a good charge of powder, and with two slugs, and laid it down. Then I loaded another gun with two bullets, and the third, for we had three pieces, I loaded with five smaller bullets. I took the best aim I could with the first piece to have shot him in the head, but he lay so with his leg raised a little above his nose that the slugs hit his leg about the knee and broke the bone. He started up, growling at first, but finding his leg broken, fell down again, 